we'll start that now. So just great. Thank you so much. All right, great. Seeing some folks put information on where they're coming from into chat. And maybe we'll give it one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, looks like we have a good number of folks here today. So I'm going to just kick us off. And I think we're actually expecting to have a bit of a shorter meeting today. So probably we'll give you some time back. So here's just a little overview of our agenda today. And you should see in our meeting invite that we have a link to the slides posted online. So you can access the slide deck if you'd like to take a look at it. All right, let's keep going. So just some updates for today. We have a shorter meeting. We're probably not going to use the whole time. And then one reminder that we basically do every month, please make sure to send your contracts to us as well as to also send invoices for the intent to participate. So if you have any questions about either of those steps or you've sent something to us and you aren't hearing back, then please send us another an email to the inbox and we'll go ahead and check in on that, that document for you. All right, and then one more reminder before we really kick off. So we talked about this a little bit last month, but we did want to share a reminder that we are no longer, we've gotten rid of that October 1st deadline for the capacity building application. And instead we're moving to a collaborative deadline where we're asking facilities to send everything back to us when they feel like they have all the information that they need to fully complete their attestation form and also their budget. So if you haven't submitted something to us yet, that is totally fine. If you feel like you want to wait even into the new year to submit to us, then that is also totally fine. And we're going to talk a little bit today about a learning webinar series that might help inform some of your budget development and your attestations work. So we'll talk a little bit more about that and then those webinars are a good example of something you might wanna wait for before you choose to submit your final document to us. So thank you to everybody who has submitted. We have received a good number of submissions so far, but if you haven't, don't feel left out, that is totally okay too. All right, I'm gonna keep going and I'm not looking too closely at chat. So if there are any questions, please feel free to come off mute and just ask them. Otherwise, Lindsay, I'll let you uh, let me know if you see any questions come through. All right, let's keep going. So I will turn things over to Tyron to just do a little update on the attestations form. And thanks there, Emma. Good afternoon, everyone. Tyron Nixon here just to provide an update around our capacity building application. Our partners over at the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police uh, Chiefs uh, notified us that several of the jails have reached out to them concerning some of the questions on the CBA, uh, specifically around, I think it was question 10, around the uh, attestation portion on um, some of our unsuspended suspended information out there and so we didn't want any further confusion to be out there and so what we're going to be doing is updating that we're working with waspic right now in our internal staff to update the language in there we just want to make sure again that there's no confusion so uh, continue to use the attestation form that is out there we're hoping to get those changes out uh in, on the website here fairly soon but anyway i just wanted to give everyone that update um to make sure that we're all on the same page again we don't want any confusion out there. We're just updating the page and we're hoping to get those changes out there soon. Thanks, everyone. Any questions on that? And I don't see anything in chat. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Tyrene. All right, let's keep going. So I know that we teased this a bit in our one-to-one -one, or group check-ins that we did over the last couple of weeks to now maybe about a month ago. So we're planning to do a learning webinar series to help explain some of our program requirements and really those items that you see in the capacity building application attestation criteria. So we have a list of webinar topics that we're going to talk about right now and as we look at this list together, I think we're, we're looking to everyone on this call to also let us know, are there any items on here 
that are missing that you really need to understand better to be able to understand the requirements for the program. So I'll run through this list really quickly and then we'll talk a little bit more about the logistics. So Apple Health client eligibility and enrollment, provider enrollment with healthcare authority, and then MCO credentialing and contracting. The 30 days of medications upon release, I know we get a ton of questions about this one. The expectations for SUD medications in a facility, our case management expectations, and our clinical consultations benefit. So I'm gonna just do a quick pause as we look at this list. Are there any major topics missing here that you feel like your facility has had a lot of questions about that it might be useful to add to a learning webinar? And this is also a good topic for you to take back and I think think about at your facility. Don't necessarily need to answer today. We're we're happy to receive some answers via the inbox too. All right, I'll keep going. So we're working on figuring out the dates for these learning webinars. And I think it's possible that we might try to do the first two that you see here by the end of the year. But we do expect that we'll do, do the vast majority of these in probably the January to February timeframe. So that's just kind of a little update on the dates of this webinar series. We don't have the set dates today, but I think expect to receive some, some holds for some learning webinars in the upcoming weeks. I'm gonna keep going. So again, just a, a flag to please email us if something is missing and you can look more closely at this list again. Again, there's a link in the meeting invite where you can find more information and we'll post all this these meeting materials to our website afterwards. And please, yeah, feel free to send us questions in advance of this learning webinar series. You know, the one thing that I'm realizing missing from our list, which we are planning, is a little bit more information on working with our third party administrator to do billing. So I know we've talked a lot about that claims clearinghouse piece, and we do expect that we'll have a learning webinar and that as well, but it might not happen until the spring. So that would be after that vendor is on board. So I'm realizing that is missing from this list. Provider enrollment, MCO credentialing and billing is a mystery, totally, that's a great, so I'd say that's one of the top questions that we're getting. What is working with MCO credentialing and contracting? Like, what is that whole process? How do you do provider enrollment? What is that whole process? Um, I would say those are the top two questions we received, along with questions about 30 days of meds in hand, and then also um, client eligibility. How are we going to get folks signed up for Medicaid? So we're trying to prioritize those topics for everyone. Are there other topics that facilities really would love us to focus on? Emma, we do have a question in the chat asking about item six services by community health workers with lived experience. Yes, great question. So I think for the purposes of putting together a slide, I might have done like a little bit too much oversimplification here, but we're going to release all of the detail on the services and then do learning webinars to explain each of these services and the requirements for those services. So the community health worker benefit will be covered probably as I was going to say as part of the case management service, but I don't think that's correct. I think it will be an additional potentially an additional webinar, or will be part of one of our benefits webinars. So additional, you know, I think additional services is missing here, and we do expect that we will have a presentation on that, so apologies. Any other topics that folks would like to flag for our group today? I have one question. Um, so we did send our capacity building assessment and budget. 
Um, do we need to wait to hear from someone to submit that second invoice? You know, we Not submitted the first invoice after we got the contract for the initial 100000 And then the next thing, milestone two, is the capacity building. Once that's done, then you get forty up to 40% of your budget. But um, I thought we would probably hear, hear from someone that what you submitted is acceptable and all that before we submitted that second invoice. Is that correct? That is a great question, and we have not formally released an answer on this, but maybe we can take this back and add it to our FAQ. So I think just off the top, and maybe I shouldn't say this without consulting with the team, I think that might make the most sense. Wait for us to respond to your capacity building application, and then that will give you the go-ahead to submit the invoice. Okay, that's what I, I thought would happen, so yeah. And Thank Emma, you. this is Teresa. And as the contract person with carceral facilities, I would just second that we as the agency need to app approve or at least accept the capacity building application before we can approve the invoice. So once you get the notice that we have approved it or accepted it or whatever the language is that we're going to use, it will invite you to submit an, another invoice, which is also we refer to as an A19 because that's just the form that it's on. Okay. But essentially, then you would be saying that you are submitting this invoice to um, get paid for milestone two. Okay. And that would start that whole process very similar to how we did milestone one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I see a question in chat about the EPIC billing module. And so I think I'll summarize by saying, I think that we can talk about one-on-one -on -one support for EHR questions generally. So we're happy to accommodate that. And then commonly used codes, I think we might wanna have a conversation about just billing. We're gonna talk about like billing in general, documentation for billing. That's actually another topic that we don't have in detail here. And so, I think the short answer is that you would bill for the services that you provide and the longer answer is we can help you understand how to do that. And we'll be working with the vendor to help you understand that as well. Any other questions on this? I don't think we have a lot more content today, so keep the questions coming. <laughs> I had a question about the 30-day supply of medication. So we had a um, MOUD um, meeting last week, and it was brought up by the doctor that I noticed in here now it says in hand upon release. And there was some talk in that group about if they don't have the medication, if we don't have the medications, but they come back the next day, or we give them a seven-day supply of the medication because we have made them an appointment for day number eight. Um, is that acceptable? Because that definitely changes the whole thing for us, whether it's 30 days of medication or there's, I don't want to say workaround, but kind of a workaround to being able to get people those medications. So, I think that we would, we're happy to talk about individual plans with each facility and whether they would be considered acceptable. And I think we've talked as a group about that, um, the short-term model and how there's scenarios in which you're just not going to be able to give people medications. And so I think we're very reasonable that around those expectations. This might not exactly be what you're talking about, but we've actually also received a number of questions around SUD medications that it would typically not be allowable to provide a 30, 30 days of medications for those in those situations. And so I think absolutely like we defer to local like regulation on those types of questions. So I think if you're talking about like an SUD medication where you don't feel it's appropriate to supply 30 days of medications and the solution is we give them even like three days and then there's an appointment made with an OTP provider outside of the facility, then that it would meet our requirements as well. And we'll have more guidance on all of these pieces as part of releasing the medication information. And if there's anyone, sorry, Arthur, I, I should have let you answer this. So please feel free to jump in if you have anything else on this. I apologize. Can you repeat the question? 
no worries. I, I think we covered it. It was just about the 30 days of meds and like situations in which we need to be more flexible and maybe especially around SUD medications. Yeah, there's still a lot of discussion happening there. So we're, we've been taking in that input from, you know, a lot of different sources and a lot of the concerns that we've heard. And we, we are still working through some of that stuff within the agency. So, yeah. It kind of makes the most sense to me that the whole point is that they have access. So it could be like you said, where you have a, a certain amount in hand and then you have an appointment with the provider and then, or some combination of it. To me, it seems like the intent is the access to be able to facilitating access to that whether it be handing it to them or arranging for appointments or something. I'm seeing a couple more questions here. So really great question about the webinars and who the audience will be for the webinars. So I actually think one of the things we're going to have to do over the next couple of weeks is resend this whole webinar series. And I believe we may just be inviting cohort two to join us and just start working together moving forward. And then for this learning webinar series, we're going to invite every, probably every facility in the state, regardless of whether or not they've actually chosen to participate with us yet. And then yes, I see another question on this. Every webinar will be recorded. So we're going to record every webinar and post them to our website. And it is possible that some of these webinars, because of the level of detail we're planning to present on, they might be longer than 60 minutes. So it could be like a 90 minute, minute webinar on things like how do you do provider enrollment? I'm looking through the questions. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. I'm seeing that you. All right, I think that's all I see. So please feel free to come off mute and keep asking questions or putting them into the chat. Otherwise, I'll keep going. And I think that's it. So any any other questions we should talk about today? I'll scroll back just so folks can see that list again. This is kind of part of the eligibility and enrollment or checking enrollment, but um, we don't have provider one access here. And I know that that seems simple, but I actually am able to, uh, one of our partners or contractors, providers um, allows me to use their information so I can check because we have, I would say the majority of youth in our custody are on Medicaid, but um, I need that information. So I'm able to get it kind of, not in a direct way. And it, um, a while back, I tried multiple to try to figure out how I could get access and was not successful. So will you all help with that? That's a great question. Another frequently asked question that we received during our check-ins. We plan to talk about this topic during that eligibility webinar. And okay. so I think the, sh the short answer is that there are a number of different ways that facilities can access eligibility information. Um, and one of the ways is leaning on a provider that would be doing that case management benefit. So mm -hmm. I think it will probably look like an individualized approach in each facility to accessing that information. And if this is one of the outstanding questions that your facility has, like, how do I, how do, I do this? I, we don't feel like we know how to do this today. Definitely, um, that will be a really helpful webinar for you to attend. And then you can feel free to set up some one-on-one -on -one time with us if you leave that with questions. And, and Well, I know how to do it. it. I just can't get access. And I don't know who to talk to to get access. So maybe you guys can just help facilitate that. Got it. Thank you. You know, I think maybe I'll do a, a quick plug for it. So we're so excited to be doing this learning webinar series. We are also planning to release what we're calling a policy and operations guide, which would have like detailed information on each of these pieces. So that will come in writing. And we think the goal is probably to also have that out in early 2025. So kind of one, two, you'll have a learning webinar to verb 
for us to verbally walk you through these things. And then there'll be kind of a lengthy written document where you'll be able to find more information. Any other questions today? I really appreciate you doing this because this really hits on all the things that I know are coming next that some of it I'm not sure about how to approach. So I think this will be very helpful. Thank you. Of course. And thank you to everybody who shared feedback and helped us develop this, this series as part of our check-ins. All right. Well, I don't think we need to take up too much more of your time today. So unless there are any other questions. Emma, I think you have a question in the chat. Yeah, sorry okay. about that. Emma, can you see it or do you want me to read it out loud? Oh, please feel free to read it. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> How does the Consolidated Appropriations Act align with or differ from um, MTP 2.0 with regard to youth? So that is a great question. I'll say that we are having some conversations with DOC and DCYF on this. And we internally at HCA, we have a project team that is working on the C, what well, we call the CAA and how we can use the reentry demonstration and add maybe some requirements to the reentry demonstration to align with the CAA. And I think there's a lot more nuance on this that I won't go into in detail today, but I think the goal is that when we start going live in the summer, we could begin to comply like more broadly with this legislation. And we have some flexibility from our federal oversight body to be able to accommodate it that way. So I think expect more detail coming from healthcare authority in upcoming months on this. And otherwise, I do want to just leave it open to other folks from HCA or DOC to feel free to step in here and say anything else on that. But it's a great question. Any other questions for today? Yes, Kathleen. Hi, Emma. I thank you. I keep trying to put it in the chat, but somehow it's just direct messaging one person. So to that person, I apologize for getting this question coming to you multiple times. But um, one of the questions we've been getting as MCOs is just, what what is the role of the TPA versus what is the role of the MCOs for the facilities in in terms of um, contracting who who they're going to contract with and and for what? So I was wondering if that could be something that could be part of that MCO credentialing webinar that kind of explains the difference between what facilities will be doing with the TPA versus what they'll be doing with the MCOs. Is a great question, and so I think thank you. I, th I think we're going to maybe try to prioritize providing a little bit more information on what you work with an MCO on. Hopefully be able to provide a little bit more information by the end of the year on that. And I love that question about what do you work with the TPA on? So maybe we can put something together on that too. That's also new. We hadn't been planning on that. So we'll, we'll plan to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. And then I think for the MCO folks on the call, um, maybe expect that we'll talk a little bit more about needing mater like materials that we could jointly use to describe some of these pieces in the future. Any other questions? Oh, okay, the provider list inventory. That is a great question. I'm wondering, Arthur, would you mind talking a little bit about this? Sure. So um, we're trying to get some information from the jails about um, who's providing services in the jails or who you are planning to have provide services in the jails to the best of your knowledge today. So we reached out to our MCO partners who are, some of them are here in this meeting today to kind of help with this and reach out um, and, and get that detailed list of providers that are providing services. It could be anybody from, um, if somebody's providing MOUD in your jail, if somebody's providing medical services in your jail, 
if somebody's providing um, you know, case management or navigation services, those types of things, um, those are the types of questions they're going to be asking. Um, and that's important for us to know moving forward because we need to know you know, um, what that goes along with the credentialing and enrollment piece um, um, with Medicaid. And so um, it's going to give us a better picture of what is out there and also help the MCOs to get a better picture of, you know, what they're going to need to do moving forward as well. So um, it's really just an inventory and an ask of, you know, what who's providing those services in your jails? And then, you know, we can evaluate, are they are they known to Medicaid? Are they not known to Medicaid? And, and, and go from there and kind of evaluate next steps. Does that make sense, Anna? Yes, uh, thank you. Sorry, yeah. I couldn't get my text thing unstuck fast enough. Um, and I think it will be tricky because I'm assuming other jails are similar to Clark County and that, we have some things that are being provided through our reentry program, but then there is a larger community system around us sure. with a whole bucket load of community partners. We will list yeah. as many as we can, but certainly we don't try to gatekeep every service coming in and out of our facility because frankly, we, we can't. There's such a rich network of community partners who engage with our folks here. Um, I mean, yes, we have clearance, of course, that is managed by the jail, but yeah. as far as who a particular court is sending in to see someone, uh, we may not have that level of detail. So we can do our best. Um, yep. And I, I think that's all we can ask you to do. And I, that's a great problem to have, by the way, <laughs> um, that you have so many providers coming in that it would be hard to create a full list. But, um, you know, the more detailed it can be, the better. I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be really honest. Um, you know, because there are some there are some requirements for Medicaid, um, you know, and providers being known to Medicaid, it's probably more likely that community provider is going to be known to Medicaid. But, you know, there are occasions where that's not the case. So and Clark County is very fortunate in that we've had uh, an influx of organizations uh, that were created and are supported by people with lived experience. Um, we've really had some tremendous local growth uh, that may not all be falling in the Medicaid eligible bucket. OK, yeah. Yeah, that's what will need to happen for those, you know, we're going to need to know who's providing those services in that 90 day pre-release period, um, you know, because there will be some credentialing issues that come up there. Thank you. Any other I see the question about services that can versus are being provided and just messaged her directly. Um, so I think that each facility is putting together a plan to provide services and it can be facility dependent. Any other questions? I had a kind of broader question. I know we had talked about in the small group when it comes to the 90 days prior to release for the smaller jails, that's going to be constant turnaround. Have we figured something out where it's easier to turn their services back on or that we keep services on and bill, stop billing on day 91? That is a great question. And so I think the short answer is that we are going to be asking for some tracking using the eligibility data that you have. And that will be part, we hope that this will be part of that eligibility webinar and we have not finished this piece yet. So I think more to come on that specific piece. And that is a great example of something that will be included in the policy and operations guide. And I think, you know, tracking, it's really like twofold. It's it's partially for your own, for helping your own facility know who you're going to be able to bill for when, so that you're not expecting to get reimbursed for a service that would be outside of the 90 days. So more to come on that, great question. Any other questions today? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time. Hope you have a good rest of the day. Talk to you later.
Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Oliver.